Across the UK, across continental North America, and around the world on the internet, by webcast and by podcast, my name is Howard Hughes and this is The Unexplained. Recording this on a beautiful sunny day here in the UK, temperatures today are going to be, they tell us, 25 Celsius, so that's pretty good. Recently, Europe, of course, had a major heat wave. France endured temperatures into the 40s Celsius, I think 44, 45, uh, well into the 100s. Uh, Here in the UK, we had one day of extreme heat, and it's been pretty nice since then. We're going to be talking now about the Capel Green documentary to do with Rendlesham Forest by Gary Heseltine. It is a big production. There is already online a trailer for it. Here's a little bit of that trail. came to the edge of this field, Capel Green, and in the field, the first thing I saw was one of, the, one of our airmen upset, and Robert Ball was talking to him. The guy was scared about something. walked forward into this field, and what I could see was a 50-foot diameter, approximately, glowing mist on the ground. I saw a red light come in, came down over the field in a downward arc went to the top of this mist and I was not far from it and there was a flash of light that was blinding. All of this is being filmed and in the place was a triangular delta shaped machine, object, craft. The red, orange, glowing ball object was about two, approximately two feet off the ground. I cocked and locked the M60 machine gun. I was scared to death. I didn't know what that was. I didn't know if it was gonna hurt me. Yeah, the airman jumped the fence and went out towards it, and if it had done anything to try to harm him, I was fully prepared to open fire on him. pieces, the whole thing just just blew us away. I mean, there's no aircraft that can do that. The movements, no aircraft can even do that today. It was like a thick beam that was scanning the whole WSA, like he was looking for something. Due out, I think, around September. We'll get some clarification on that from Gary Hesseltine. Gary, thank you very much for coming back on my show. You're welcome. It's always a pleasure. Never a chore. All right. I want to talk with you for all of this conversation about the documentary, which you've called Capel Green. Now, explain to people um, who perhaps don't understand the locations too well, what what is Capel Green in relation to RAF Bentwaters and you know Rendlesham Forest, the twin air bases there? Right. I think most people are familiar with the fact that uh, the Rendlesham Forest incident occurs um, in Suffolk uh, between, in an area of forest between two bases, as you say, Arief Bentwaters and Arief Woodbridge, which are approximately two, two and a half miles away from each other, separated by a large forest that we now know as Rendlesham Forest. Capel Green uh, is a field is what's known as a farmer's field, the name of a farmer's field, on some of the old maps. 
So this is relevant to uh, uh, to an event that occurs in this farmer's field. And the, on the maps, it says the farmer's field is called Capel Green. So hence why the, firm, the film got called Capel Green with the strap line of Capel Green, the truth behind the Reynolds and Forest incident. Um, but obviously, most people are just referring it to it now as Capel Green. But that's the story on that. Right. And that was the, the place that uh, was really the place that was the, the zenith of the experiences. And you say that there were other events as precursor events before the main attraction. Yeah. Did those events involve local people or were they all military personnel? No, these are three military cases involving military personnel uh, who have never gone on camera before. Uh, and uh, if you see in the uh, the International Movie Database trailer that I gave you the link to, which you said you've watched and you thought was very slick, uh, I think you will see two of those people on camera briefly there, uh, along with some of the special effects uh, that surround that. Uh, what's what's what we're doing a little bit different with Capel Green, or a lot different, is that because it's independent and nobody has got an agenda, i.e. through a TV bias, a money bias, we're making the programme, we'll tell you what to do kind of thing. Uh, it, it gives me as the co-writer the, and the lead researcher the opportunity to get material out that I think is relevant to the public and should be in the public domain. Uh, and when you look at it in that then. There is so much material that I have found going right back from day one after the incident that should have been in the documentaries, the 50 or 60 documentaries made to date, but for whatever reason, they've not uh, been shown. And a lot of this uh, new information, I think, as a former detective, I think is real relevance to the case. Uh, having worked on two nuclear bases myself during the uh, my period in the RAF police, between 1983 and 1989, uh, I, I first served at RAF Honington in Suffolk, which is not a million miles away from Rendlesham, and uh, guarded tactical nuclear weapons for tornado aircraft, doing exactly the same job as the people involved in this. So I have a slight uh, unique uh, in, insight into how nuclear weapons protection goes and the amount of people involved, the locations, the layout of the bunkers, the hot rows, etc., the security involved. And, and, and I think, again, this is an opportunity to give people more information than they've ever had before. And that's what I've said on many, many shows. In fact, I've said it on your show several times that that is my aim is to give you more information than you've ever had before. And let, let's be fair about it. It is so controversial and there is such a thirst and appetite for more information that that's exactly what the public want. And that's a reason why this documentary, I think, is likely to be a big success. How did you find these new accounts and this new information, Gary? Many of the people were known about and had maybe been on social media, but they'd never really attracted any attention. One or two had said that, you know, posted things on their own page, but they'd never been on any shows or anything like that. Uh, and really, what you get is a domino effect. And, and I used to find this early on with my police uh, UFO research, is that you you get a sighting with a police officer and uh, they get to know you, they find that you're okay, and then they tell their mates who's had a sighting, and suddenly you get a phone call or a number for somebody else to call. Yeah, he had a sighting. And it's like it, it, it begins a bit of a domino effect. Well, that happens... Uh, has happened here with Rendlesham. Um, although I would still say there are... M Let's put this in perspective. If we were to uh, hazard a guess at the number of, of US security police personnel, including law enforcement, who uh, witnessed some of these events over the three or four nights of activity, I would hazard a guess that that's 100 plus just on the security police side and the law enforcement side. Now, of that, we probably may know 30 of those names who have ever spoken uh, publicly, uh, which is really not many. So the vast majority who have got information, relevant information, because I think of the way that the politics have played out, especially over the last 10 or 15 years, and this is what has become a recurrent theme when I've talked to the witnesses who are coming forward, is that many uh, didn't want to get involved because they saw what was going on as a misrepresentation 
of actually what they witnessed. So, And when you is, say a misrepresentation, what did they feel was being done to the story? Well, essentially, if you were to, if you were since oh, the mid-1990s, essentially every documentary that's ever made has just focused primarily on three people. Lieutenant Colonel Holt, Charles Holt, the, uh, the deputy base commander, uh, John Burroughs uh, and Jim Penniston have been the three. And occasionally uh, some of the documentaries featured Larry Warren, which was a much more controversial uh, story in a standalone story. Or is that how people would like you to believe that it's a standalone story when it's not? But essentially those three people are what people associate with Rendlesham Forest. And I think a lot of the witnesses that will come on screen during this are now going to say we're coming forward. Like, for example, last year I brought over Steve Longero, who is this new witness, uh, who uh, is absolutely an absolute gold miner uh, as a witness in the sense of he has a very similar a uh, policing background to me, i.e. six years in the U.S. Air Force Police, security police, guarding nuclear weapons, and then he had a 24-year sheriff's police career. So he had a law enforcement 30 years, same as mine, as an equivalent. And this guy, who I did not know, I ended up having a, uh, a transatlantic phone call for about three and a half hours. And at the end of that three and a half hours uh, 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 conversation, uh, I'd probably establish the, the, the greatest or the most significant movement forward in uh, actual major developments of the case uh, since since the likes of Holt, Penis and Burroughs came out. So what, what did he tell you that we didn't know already? Well, I'm only going to tell you half of what he told you, mm. but the half that I will tell you uh, which is, if you, again, if you see the IMDb trailer, he goes on camera uh, for the first time. And what he basically says is that he arrived at the base in uh, early December, I think it was the 2nd or 3rd of December, and he arrived within a day of Larry Warren arriving there. Now, keep this in, in the background that Larry Warren and Steve Longero were on the same police training course. They did their basic police training together, and they arrived within a day or so of each other to Bentwards and Woodbridge. Now, uh, this is relevant because people talk about, oh, people can't have been on shift, they hadn't have been there long enough. Well, Steve Longero, as a new uh, airman, uh, inexperienced, finds himself on, uh, on duty with a senior, experienced airman inside... Uh, the weapon storage area, the nuclear weapon storage area. But what he will say is that he's walking around with his uh, M16 uh, inside the weapon storage area with an, an experienced airman when suddenly they see uh, a an object over the nearby forest. Uh, now, for those of people who are unfamiliar with the layouts of a weapon storage area, then you have uh, effectively at Bentwaters, you have one row of nuclear bunkers, um, it, uh, and it's surrounded by a dual layer inner and outer uh, electrified fence. Uh, it's uh, guarded by microwaves in the ground sensors, etc., and it's in and, and essentially it's a it's a sealed off area. It's the most secure area of their entire base because obviously the nature of what they're guarding. And they see nearby, and, and, and as with all uh, squadrons and nuclear facilities, they always have a forest nearby. Right, okay, but the trees are kept to a maximum height of 40 feet, and they have one high tower within the weapon storage area that's 80 feet high that gives a full 360-degree panoramic view of the entire forest, obviously, so it can spot any threats coming from the sky. Well, basically, what he will say is that he is inside when above the trees nearby, they see an object coming over that he describes as like a disc that's dripping like molten metal, which is what other people, Holt has described that, other witnesses have described like something dripping off that appears to be molten metal. And then this object does something very strange. It then fires a beam of light down from it, from its under, undercarriage, as it were, into the weapon storage area, and then begins like a grid's, pendulum search of all the nuclear bunkers. Now, we've had rumours in the past mm. 
uh, and questions were asked in Parliament uh, within weeks of the case breaking in October 1983, but we never had a name to it. Well, now we've got this name of a guy who was inside who will now say and stand up once this film is released and be there to be questioned. Uh, I will say that he will say that I was there and I saw this. So he was essentially saying, I think, that he saw something scan those bunkers. Correct, which is a pretty, pretty big thing. And if you think about in October 93, when questions were asked based on alleged stories of beams being shone near the nuclear weapon storage area. Well, the Ministry of Defence and the House of Commons people, the Defence Secretary, etc., all came back at the time and said this case was of no defence significance. Well, I think now this surely is going to come, come back to haunt them with the, in light of this new information, uh, as if to say, well, if it wasn't relevant then, it surely is now, because if you have an object shining what would appear to be an intelligently scanned across all the bunkers, this is an intelligent act that w you would assume, um, there's some intelligence behind the object, wherever it's from, whatever it is, and it's all done in total silence, that this has got to be of major defence significance uh, in 1980. So I think we need to have a serious re-examination of what was considered no defence significance. And what of those who said at the time and have been saying for years that the beams and lights were in fact a local lighthouse? Well, uh, it, if, if for anybody to be saying that, realistically, um, then you have to be involved from my point of view, as in, in involved in a conspiracy to deny the truth. Because uh, Holt said at the time, I used to take people into the forest. I used to take people to the Orford Lighthouse. No, it was not the light uh, from the lighthouse that he saw, that his men saw, etc. Uh, it's ludicrous to assume that an object can stop above your feet, as in with one of Holt's account on his audio tape, that the object stops at a thousand feet and then shines a beam down at your feet. You know, the small objects that are seen the basketball size objects that are seen near the nuclear weapons storage area in some of the precursor cases that will be revealed in the film. This is clearly nothing to do with lighthouses, and anybody that says they are, I think, really uh, are part of a cover-up to downplay the significance. And, and, and you actually touch on a very good point here, and it's something that you may not like because you're in the mainstream media. But for someone like me, who has been, in a sense, uh, arguing with the mainstream media to tell the truth, you think of the logic here. Um, all of these things uh, in all of the 50, 60 documentaries being made worldwide, and we still talk about lighthouses, uh, it's ludicrous. And that can only be for one reason, is that someone wants to create the doubt in half the mind of the public in Britain. And this is why this isn't a really important opportunity from an independent production point of view to actually say, well, no, it ain't any of those things. Mm. Let's just put the facts out there. And that's all I'm interested in is the fact. And, and again, one of the other things that's never been shown properly in TV documentaries, and I've worked on probably half a dozen involving Rendlesham, uh, is the fact that they never actually base their special effects um, on actual witness descriptions. They, they tend to be very liberal in the way that objects are portrayed on screen. Some are better than others. But what we will do with Capel Green, we've got a great special effects guy who is, you know, and he is basing it entirely on the witness descriptions. So if it's a red beach ball size object, it's a red beach ball size object with a dark glowing centre. That's what you're going to see. So everything that you see on screen is actually based on witness testimony, not on artistic licence given from a, a special effects guy who just wants to make a show. Right. Now, I do do work in the mainstream media, but when I'm doing this, um, I do not consider myself to be in any way part of the mainstream media. I've uh, I've paid my dues over the years by doing shows like this. And, you know, I've had colleagues in, in regular newsrooms that I've worked in who still don't understand that I do this. So, you know, I've kind of, I have to some degree my spurs in this field, Gary. But the one oh, thing that I would say... But you've been doing this for a long time. Long time. It's to be it's <laughs> to be applaud but it's I'm, to be I'm applauded because, because you're to be applauded because you are one of the few who has been doing it for so long 
who, who's not been afraid to stick your head above the parapet in the mainstream and say, well, actually, there is some very interesting things going on. Well, I, I believe that there are things that need investigating and, uh, you know, some parts of the media are not investigating them, even today, which is a big surprise to me and I'm sure to you. Absolutely. But the, the one thing I would say that if there was some kind of high-level attempt to cover up the true significance of this, and I think, you know, I probably will get panned for saying this, but there's little doubt that something be way beyond the norm happened there. There are many, many, many people and events that happened before Holt got out into that forest. So this is what's going to be presented for the first time, is that there's so much new information. Uh, I, 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 The last time I looked... We're looking at over 30 plus new revelations about Reynolds and Forest. Uh, I can't go into too much detail, as, as the director will kill me. Literally. <laughs> uh, uh, he's probably going to kill me now okay, for what I've already said. You've got to give me something. Uh, but these things, do they all substantiate the core story? And the core yes. story is no, that no, something no, no, no. not of this earth was involved across those nights. Yes. And this is going to clear up. With the, with the accurate uh, representation of what was shown by the witnesses, that's all we're going to do is base it on the witness testimony. And believe me, some of the witness testimony that I've uh, uh, come across over the last two years is absolutely remarkable. Nobody has heard of it. It's never been shown. And it will rewrite the way we look at Reynoldsham. And it will, if questions are asked of certain people, then it won't be me who's going to ask those questions. It will be for reporters and the public to ask certain people why certain things have maybe not been reported in the right way. But let me tell you, the, 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 when people talk about what is there to cover up at Reynolds and Forest, well, I'll tell you what is there to cover up. Let's just presume for a moment that there was a meeting of a, with a landed craft between the base commander, Colonel Williams, with entities, three entities, in a field, a farmer's field called Capel Green, and that there, was, there were numerous other security police personnel there, that it was being filmed. Do you think the American government, the American military, the British government, the British military would want that to be actual fact? I don't think so. Once the memo came out, they couldn't do anything about that. That was not supposed to come out, and it led its own life. They couldn't control that. But the big story about Reynolds and Forest is Capel Green and this event in the field, and that is what they're trying to cover up. And this is what will be shown in depth in Capel Green. With people that we haven't heard speaking before about that. Yes. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, obviously, look, I know you've got this this product that you're putting out. You're very proud of it. It isn't out yet, so you can't tell me the whole story. And, you know, look, I know how this works. That's fine. But what sorts of things do they tell you that lead you to believe that this lends credibility to that which you've just told me? Well, put it this way. A lot of the confirmations have nothing to do with Larry Warren. I found during my investigation that I've probably got around at least a dozen confirmations of the event happening in the field that have nothing to do with Larry Warren. And uh, that is pretty amazing when you start to collect them here and there over the years going back literally from the days after the incident. I mean, how many people realise that the first people to mention aliens was never Larry Warren. This was within two or three days of the event when the original civilian uh, uh, investigator of the uh, the uh, case, uh, uh, Dot Street, uh, Brenda Butler, had a friend who was in the military who said that there was uh, three entities and a landed craft in a meeting with a base commander in a farmer's field. Way before Larry Warren said that. Hmm. So, uh, why, so. why do you think the people who've spoken to you and we'll see them in the documentary. Why do you think they waited? W were they lent on? Were they told not to speak? Uh, I think there's a variety of reasons for that. Uh, I know that in one of the uh, the incidents, one of the precursor incidents, uh, Michael Stacy Smith, uh, you'll see him in the trailer, in the, in the IMDb trailer, he's, he's, he's manning an M60, which is like a big Rambo heavy machine gun, and he has an incident uh, in one of the three precursor cases uh, where he sees a beach ball size object just outside the fence line to the uh, one of the squadrons. So he's in the base and just outside the fence line he sees this object. Uh, he then calls for backup, two people come out and one of them 
uh, moves towards this small glowing uh, beach ball sized red object. And at the time he does that, he's thinking, well, if that object does anything to, uh, threatening towards uh, the airman going towards it, uh, I he was he was shaking like a leaf. He, he cocked his weapon. He was ready to open fire with a heavy heavy, heavy caliber uh, weapon. And so this is kind of the reality that we're dealing with. We're not talking about flying lighthouses now. We're something that's maybe 30, 50 meters away. But Michael Stacy Smith uh, had another incident that got uh, him within 50 feet of one of the objects, and he has uh, subsequently gone on in life to have to develop many. Uh, tumours, and uh, 20 years later, he's, he's riddled with tumours that nobody can account for. His doctors are saying, have you been exposed to some kind of strange radiation? And basically, he can get no help. He's very ill, uh, as in his life is at risk. And I think this is one of the reasons why he came forward, because he saw it as a way of saying, well, I know what I saw, and other people are suffering like me, and we should be getting help. Uh, and if you think about that, John Burroughs, Mm -hmm. uh, got paid out uh, for developing a heart problem when he had close proximity injuries associated with what he saw on one of the nights at Rendlesham Forest. Yes, I'm uh, aware of that, yeah. Yeah, so, so he got paid out by the VA, but lots of other witnesses who were ill and developing type of radiation-type cancers are not getting help. So, again, that's one of the motivations why some people are coming forward. Steve Longero's motivation was, after all these years of watching some of the documentaries, he was seeing Larry Warren absolutely getting castigated and knowing that he saw him out in the forest on that night when he did. So he got so hacked off with the way and the abuse that he was getting that he said, no, I'm going to come forward because I I can back this guy up. He, I didn't see what he saw, but he was. I, I can verify that he was out in the forest that night, close to where that he said what he said he saw. And I suspect that after this film comes out, people will be asking certain questions of certain people as to why things have been shown and presented over the many years it has. And I think the real answer to that is because certain people wanted to downplay the significance of what happened in the farmer's field. And if that happened, uh, they don't want this to come out. It's something that we really don't want to come out. And I think there's really good grounds why they would want to cover this up. What are you going to do after this thing comes out then? Because you say that it gives us a lot of new information. It puts a lot of extra impetus to the case that something really significant happened there and perhaps to some extent, to a large extent, was covered up. Um, are you going to do something else about this? Are you going to campaign or are you just going to let the, the documentary, the accounts in it, speak for themselves? Well, if there's any justice um, and and... Dion, the editor, is a, is a quality editor, uh, and everything is filmed in 4K, uh, both on the ground and in the air. You know, the special effects, the 4K aerial drone footage is is going to revolutionise the way the cases look. Nobody's actually ever shown the forest properly. Very rarely do maps get shown other than where Bentwaters and Woodbridge is and where the forest is. Very rarely do people say, well, this happened here, this happened here. In, in, in a, a plan overview. Well, we're going to be doing that. We're going to be addressing all of these issues. And some of the things that have come out are clearly going to point to major, major cover-up, predominantly, I think, by the, the, the US military and government, but let's say the military. Uh, and I think that there will be a lot of questions asked. In the run-up to the film, uh, we are going to try to get MPs, our respective MPs, uh, of those in the film crew. Uh, we're going to try to get publicity. We're going to show the sequence. We're developing a short sequence media pack, uh, especially the Steve Longero nuclear weapons aspect, uh, the beam shone in, to try to get these very serious questions raised in Parliament again, because these do need to be addressed. And if you think, Howard, in light of the Pentagon admissions in December of 2017, there has never been a more apt time for Capel Green to come out, because it's coinciding with the announcement that mm -hmm. these things are real, that are operating in the US airspace way beyond the capabilities of the best fighter pilots out there. Uh, there's been three uh, Pentagon released authorized videos so far, uh, and apparently there are a good 20 others in the pipeline to come out as well, I'm told, by Grant Cameron, one of the prominent researchers involved in that process. And basically what you have is an admission now 
They're not talking about aliens because that's a big leap because they don't want to be stigmatized with the the, the, the stigma that has been around this subject for 70 years. So they just want to say, look, let's just get it out there. These things are actually real. They are on radar. They have been seen visually and on confirmed on radar. And they are moving far beyond anything that our top pilots, top gun pilots can do. I mean, there's a groundswell of, of calls. There's a groundswell of, of clamour for there to be an admission that we have been, and I say we, I mean the US, the UK, have been investigating something. There's been something to investigate, in other words. Absolutely. I mean, we, for, for researchers, UFO researchers, we've known along that that can't be true because we know of the that in the best cases around the world, the Americans turn up, whether it be the Tehran incident, uh, Calaris in Brazil, they turn up uh, and they, they've dominated the subject. But the point being is that for the Pentagon to admit that these things are real, this is not people's figment of, of the imagination, this is not misidentification, this is not astronomical, uh, atmospheric, etc. To acknowledge that was a huge thing in on December 16th, 2017. And now, and it's not, it's not actually come over to the UK yet, but in America now, there is unprecedented mainstream media news discussions where they're having serious discussions about what these things can be. And they're talking to the pilots. They're talking to the top radar specialists about what these things are and how can they be moving in the way that they're moving. So that is a huge advance. Now, I think it's only a matter of time before that then starts to come over to the UK. And I think what will make that happen is Capel Green when it's when it's out. The people that you've spoken to, you say that you have new people and new accounts and substantiating accounts. Do you also believe, bearing in mind that there were, I think you said, a hundred people involved in this, that there are many other people who would perhaps like to give their accounts and might be encouraged to give their accounts once your documentary comes out? Yes, I think I think that's entirely possible, and there will be an appeal in the credits for new witnesses to come out. I think I think you will see that uh, that there are uh, well. I think what's likely to happen is that if there is any justice, the film should be well received uh, because of the incredible amount of new information. It's only based on the truth. I'm not interested in the politics, but there is a politics side that can't be avoided because it, it's led to certain decisions being made. But the fact, the point is that I think that, yes, I think some witnesses who have got stories to tell uh, are likely to come forward if the film is deemed to be a success. And do you think that Larry Warren, who, as we know, is has been or has become a controversial character with people taking a view on him, and I don't want to get back into that debate, but do you think that he will come out of this saying that this production and this groundswell that you are starting has vindicated me? Is that what would you think he's going to say at the end of this? I think you best leave that for him. But it, it, uh, what I can say is that it will vindicate him because there is, without a shadow of a doubt, a lot to say that what his account was genuine. He said certain things before anyone else did, and uh, I found lot, lots of confirmations to his account. Uh, and obviously, through the investigations that we've done, people put him there uh, that uh, that indeed it happened. So uh, no doubt he will say that. But but let's not forget that this whole process of Capel Green started in. July of 2017, and the 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 editor, the director, Dion, contacted me and said I've had a chance meeting with Larry Warren in uh, at Rendlesham, believe it or not, uh, and uh, he said contact me. And I said, well, there's a lot of controversy about him. If I was you, the first thing I would do is get him to do a polygraph test. He said for years he's happy to do one, and I got involved in that process. And uh, I was not there when the test was done, but I was there when it was being set up, uh, and and met with the polygraph examiner who is uh, Britain's leading polygraph examiner with over 2,000 tests worked uh, with the military and governments in the, both the US and the UK, uh, lots of uh, overseas sensitive material and uh, she is the top top kind of person in the UK. What sort of questions were asked in the test do you know? I know exactly what was in there uh, and uh, but that's for the documentary. <laughs> Mm. I mean, do they ask him the yeah, things that the, the things that he specifically claimed that are different yes, from other yes, claims? They asked him yes, about those. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and, uh, uh, when you see the film, we had remote cameras on the whole of the test, and so we all left the house 
just leaving Larry uh, with the examiner. We have six remote cameras, and that will all feature, or part of it will feature in the film. Uh, but you'll find it very compelling, and uh, and you'll find it also very compelling what the polygraph egg and examiner says afterwards. The best productions of this kind leave us with a question. What question do you think this one is going to leave us with? Um, well, that's a good. That's a good question, that, Howard. Um, it's a question one, about a question. <laughs> one, one of the questions I hope it leaves is: I hope people realise now the extent. After watching the film, I think people will now uh, possibly look at the subject of the UFOs not with the stigma, not with the little green men aspect, and realise that my God, did this really happen? And it did really happen, and the witnesses are all going to be on there uh, in full colour and giving their accounts. So uh, this is going to make people think. And if people just really think uh, about what they were involved in and what they witnessed, then uh, I think people's uh, ideas on this subject may change. Rendlesham Forest has always been one of those top five, top ten cases around the world that has the ability, if shown properly, if handled properly, to be a bit of a game changer when it comes to pushing for disclosure. And I maintain that, that if, if we do our job properly and the final version does justice to what we've accumulated over two years, then uh, that should happen. You can understand a sceptical person, maybe a sceptical researcher, would say, well, if this thing happened, if this thing happened, you know, the thick end of 40 years ago, how come it was a one-off like that? OK, you say there were precursor events, and we'll hear about those in the documentary. But how come it didn't repeat? It didn't happen six months later? Well, there was a case in February of uh, 1981. So, you know, we, we only f focus on the three precursor cases. But there was a well-known case invo involving Holt, I think, and other witnesses in uh, February of 1981 uh, at Bentwaters and Woodbridge. So I think events did happen. But if you're talking about worldwide and other cases, what makes Reynoldsham a bit unique is that uh, is the amount of incursions, the amount of activity, the amount of day-to-day -day events that took place, uh, which is unprecedented. Uh, sightings take place all over the world, but they tend to be a one-off beam shone down into the Maelstrom 10-minute missile, you know, nuclear weapons shut them down as a one-off event. And then there's another base that will be affected. But this is a series of multiple incursions uh, over, over several a short period of time. That's what makes Rendlesham a bit different, and I think that's one of the reasons why uh, the case has, uh, has, uh, has been played down by the authorities, because they do not want people to realise just what went on there. Because if they did, people might think that UFOs are real and ET is real, and people can't be thinking that, can they? You've obviously heard, as I've heard, the recordings of the radio traffic people sent out to investigate this thing. And those recordings show people with fear in their voices. One of the questions that follows on from all of it is, what was it that went on there that was capable of scaring people who were trained not to be scared? Well, I think that's a, you've just answered your own question. Uh, clearly, you do see the uh, um, the fear. You, you can detect the fear and apprehension in the voices. I think when you're dealing with something truly profound and you don't know what it is, as many of the witnesses have been telling me, that they were fearful of their lives. And the other thing that is going to come out of this is that many of them had their weapons taken off them, going out into the forest, and when they then subsequently saw... Uh, UFO activity, strange objects moving through the forest, they felt extremely vulnerable. They felt that they were almost ready to be used as a, to be killed, uh, and, and they felt defenseless. And that has left some of them with a, a quite a lot of anger towards the US or the military authorities because they felt stripped of the, an ability to fire back at these things if they were attacked. Various people who were involved have said over the years that they were advised not to speak about this in the strongest terms. Do you know any more about that process, about what happened in the subsequent days and how people were told, keep your mouth shut about this? 
Absolutely, yeah. That, 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 that's a matter of public record. Uh, there were interrogations, at least five people were interrogated, at least two were given uh, sodium pentothal, including Larry Warren, including Jim Peniston, uh, True Sear and those kind of things. Now, I think that there were a whole series. If you, if, if you just take, for example, Jim Peniston, Jim Peniston will say that well, I think within three days of his event, the first night, that he was interviewed something like 10 or 12 times uh, by various people, the base commander, the deputy base commander, one or two other people, OSI, you know. But here's an interesting thing as well, is that a lot of people talk about statements being given, but only five statements have ever surfaced. And of those statements, uh, three of them are in the wrong format. And, and in the case of Edgar Banzak, he says, that's not my statement. I didn't write that. So you've clearly got a hoax there. So, so in that, there is a lot more documentation. In fact, I've talked to people who've said, I gave a statement. Well, this has never been disclosed. And when you think about the Rendlesham case, when Georgina Brunei got involved with her book, You Can't mm. Tell the People, uh, around the year 2000 when that came out, and she wasn't a UFO researcher. She came from an entertainment background, but she did a pretty good job, put the book together, a very good book, really, as an overview. I, I spoke with her in about 2004, yes. Yeah, and, and it was a pretty good book, and it, and it did its best to bring it all together in, in, in a logical way, and she did a good book. But what she will say is that uh, uh, for t years and years that she was investigating, the uh, U.S. Uh, government just totally refused, no, we haven't got any more documents, no more documents. And then I think literally in the year 2001, another 100 pages of uh, information were released. So it was clear that it, it, for a long time, it's like pulling teeth. They, they don't want to reveal anything. And don't forget, with the Holt Memorandum, for many, many years, within days of the incident happening, the likes of Brenda Butler, Dot uh, 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 Street, uh, then joined by Jenny Randalls, were submitting Freedom of Information. Harry Harris, an early UK researcher, he got involved. And they were all being told there's no documentation. Nobody was mentioning the me a memorandum. But that actually came out indirectly through Larry Warren because he spoke to a Connecticut policeman in 1982 called uh, Larry Fawcett. Larry Fawcett then uh, new people who worked for the campaign against UFO secrecy cause, he then said, I got a witness in America who said he was a part of this. And on the strength of that, they then submit another FOI. And amazingly, this time, the whole memorandum surfaces and nobody knew it existed. But of course, once that came out, then that said that there was a landed craft on the first night, approximately three metres by three metres in a clearing, which is the John and Jim uh, first night event. And then two nights later, Holt was saying that he saw multiple UFOs himself. So this was a whole new bald game, but it was pulling teeth. It was only through a mistake that that came out. And literally, I suspect there is a hell of a lot more information uh, on record out there. And, and remember, on one occasion, very early on, uh, Brenda and Dot went in uh, and I think they had a meeting with Holt uh, within months, and uh, they didn't really know him at that time, but they went in, and there was apparently a big, big folder uh, that was like Mark Reynoldsham, like a, what, a classic six, eight inches in depth. And then he thought that they were from the Ministry of Defence, believe it or not. Uh, and then as soon as he realised that they weren't, that quickly was put away. So, again, who knows? But I, it hints that there is much more paperwork to come out from this. And I think if, if Capel Green does its job, uh, then I think it will, it, it will rattle some uh, apples from the trees, put it that way. You were first of all hoping to release this about May, I think. Um, it's now looking like September. Why the delay? because there's so much material. Um, what you've also got to realise is that people are doing this over and above their normal day jobs. We're not working on this full time. Well, I am because I, I this is my job. But for like the directory, he's a cameraman doing other uh, promotional material for other companies. And so he's doing this over and above. He's the edit. He's got the one with the editing skills. And that's where really 
uh, the the film is going to be made good or bad. We have over 55, 60 hours of material to condense into a feature length, which is going to be two, mm. two and a quarter hours. Now, that's a mammoth task in itself. We are still getting new bits of information. For example, we uh, we did a, the, a film shoot two months ago in Reynolds Sherman. It was only meant to be like some finishing off shots, just the things that you thought of later on that you need for continuity for the film. And that actually led us to another sighting uh, event. Uh, and uh, one, the film crew, Dion, the director, and one of the uh, extras had a late night sighting of a strange object. That'll be in the film. Uh, I wasn't there, but they saw something very strange, which I can't go into. Uh, and then we were also alerted to uh, there's a house that uh, is at the end of RAF uh, Woodbridge runway called the Foley House. Mm -hmm. If you look on any maps, well, uh, Dion knocked on a door and said, "You know, have you ever have you ever had any strange experiences?" Well, I've had one experience, but my kids had a really strange experience. That then led us down an entirely new path. Uh, and so, again, two, two children aged 11 and 13 give fascinating, corroborating, separate accounts that corroborated each other of a very strange event, which, again, will feature in the film. So something very strange is still going in that forest to this day. And, uh, again, lots of little reasons why you just put the date back and date back. But, we, we you know, it's we are as desperate as everybody else to get the film out because originally it was a sort of small film probably going to be out within a year but uh, we grew exponentially there are 11 or 12 american interviews uh and and let's just talk about music we'll cover music in some depth and with some people with famous links uh that will corroborate all of what you said about the music industry and larry warren so don't worry about that i'll be in the film um and uh it's all there uh, and uh, but it's a it's turned into a mammoth project <laughs> Uh, it certainly so, sounds it, Gary. Um, listen, I can only wish you the very best of luck with it. I'm sure there'll be huge international interest in it, both before and after the release. Um, how much money have you spent on this? It's an independent production. There's been nobody putting any money other than ourselves. Um, Dion has put in quite a lot of his own money into this. Various people throughout the film shoots over the two years and hotels and whatever. I've probably put in two grand in hotels and travel expenses and whatever, but it's not for me. I've never been motivated by money. And for me, it's about making a significant difference to the way this case is, is, is viewed. And so if I never made a penny, it wouldn't bother me. It probably uh, uh, bothered Dion because he's invested more heavily. But suffice to say, for me, it's, it's really about telling the truth and, and getting the facts out there. And the fact that it's independent and having worked on mainstream TV, I can tell you that there is no bias this time. And I, as the lead researcher and co-writer, can actually just have a blank canvas and say, this is what's relevant. Hmm. This, in my opinion, is what the public needs to be told. Okay, so, you, you, so hate me, you hate me for this question, though. Isn't your bias, you know, that people say they're not biased. I think everybody has some degree of bias, you know, one, even if they don't think they do. You want this to be true. That's your bias, isn't it? Uh, well, no, no. The, 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 it can only be true if the facts are there to support it, and the facts are there to support it. Um, uh, no, the belief is one thing, truth is another. Uh, and um, this is entirely based on truth, uh, Howard. So that's where we separate fact from fiction, isn't it? Well, that's going to be the quote I take away from this, Gary. Uh, belief is one thing, truth is another. Like I say, I wish you well with it. We'll talk, you know, again a, a, around the time of release, maybe on the radio show. But, uh, you know, I know it's been a lot of hard work. And good luck, as I say. Thank you, Gary. I, 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 I think I think one thing that mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to invite you to the premiere, we're hoping to maybe have a cinema premiere somewhere um, to launch it. And, I'd uh, like to be there. Uh, so I'd like you to see it. Uh, I'm there to be shot at. I'm more than happy to be there to be shot at. Um, and I, why would I put my reputation well, in the line to make a lie? I wouldn't. So I want to so, see you unfold the story. I, you know, I, I think the trail from what I've seen of it looks very good, looks very professional. Well, as I say, one of the things that we're hoping to do, but you can only do it once it's finished, is, is submit it to film festivals around the world. We've already had some input with... Uh, marketing production on that uh, and but basically you have to have the finished product first before you can submit an application so of course we've got to finish the film first which is what we're actively seeking to do now and as soon as it's finished then we can submit the entries to prominent film uh, documentary film festivals around the world and hopefully 
if there's any justice, because of the amount of new material and the explosive nature of what we're doing, hopefully it'll get uh, selected to be shown. And if that happens, then who knows what will happen after that. But it deserves to, because uh, uh, we've got some very good people involved in this. And uh, two years, by then, two years and two months is a long time of your life. I had no idea that it would take as long as this. I'm sure my wife <laughs> would be glad that it's over with tomorrow, uh, for obvious reasons. But that, that, that's the same with all of us. But it's going to be worth it in the end. So stick with us. And, uh, and I will gladly, once we have... Uh, the uh, premiere day, I will gladly send you some complimentary tickets. Well, I'd love to see it. I'm looking forward to it very, very much. And it's one of the, like you said, and I've been involved in projects like this myself, it's one of those things that once, once you start, you're committed to it. You can't go back. Well, absolutely. You know, um, I never envisaged uh, that it would take this long. But as I've said to my wife all along, you know, we're, we're actually talking about something that's actually very serious in history. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, that we have a duty to tell it as best we can. And as more witnesses came forward, then you've got to listen to them. And uh, that's what we've done. So uh, I hope that uh, it will be worth it in the end. I sincerely believe that it, it, it will be and it should be. And it's called Cable Green. I look forward to seeing you at the premiere. I look forward to seeing you too. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you, Gary, very much. Well, I watched cameras go through the actions of filming, and I know still pictures were taken. And off the fabric of this machine thing came this bluish gold bubble uh, that was about a foot off the ground, and it split into three. And inside that, the upper extremities of what I only can say was a non-human entity. We have actual motion picture film of the UFO. And it was given to the F-15 that pulled, flew from Germany onto uh, Bentwaters airfield. And it was handed to the pilot canopy closed and the plane took off. This craft or whatever it was, it kind of started back like it was backing out of the WSA and it started going over the treetops of the forest. What told me this was alive is that when they moved, 